Okay, we're back. We're live. It's 2 p.m. on a given Monday, and we're talking about the Appleseed Foundation. We have Gavin Thornton from the Appleseed Foundation joining us. Thanks for coming around, Gavin. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to be here virtually. Yes, I was only kidding about the coming around. <laughs> <laughs> virtually. Everything is virtual now. Yeah, so um, Appleseed, very important and interesting organization. Can you tell us a little about it? Sure. Um, you know, the basic mission of Hawaii Appleseed is to do research and advocate for policies and systems change that help create a Hawaii where everyone can thrive. Um, a focus on low income and marginalized people, but really we want a community where everybody has the opportunity to succeed. How well you've been doing? What was that? How well have you been doing? Because you know Hawaii uh, has a large, a large portion of the Hawaii community is disadvantaged, and they don't have money, and they're homeless, and I mean it's not it's not a picture of um, you know it's not a beautiful picture, yeah, and well, you, you you in a way you you are you have the toughest job of all to try to help them. Yeah? That's right. We we have yet to to win that fight, and I think in fact with the pandemic. Um, you know, we've we've seen things get a whole lot worse uh, for a whole lot of, of people. Um, the people that were on the margins um, have now, you know, fallen into dire straits. Um, so I think our, our work is applicable to a lot more folks than it was even just two months ago, um, which which is uh, which is really frightening, frankly. Um, it is. It is frightening. I mean, what's happening is frightening. And uh, the average person, you know, the interesting thing I've been observing in in my own group of friends. Uh, so you stay home, and you work at home, and you watch the television and documentaries, national documentaries, and all kinds of entertainment at home. But you and you read the paper to the extent you can, but the paper has reduced its staff and range. And um, you know, it's not clear that you really understand what's happening a mile, two, three miles away with people who are, who are out of work or who never had good work to begin with, people who are hungry and were never really full anyway. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think we have to be very aware that you are kind of, you know, you're kind of a, a buffer between the people who are only semi-informed and what's really out there. So it's very important that we talk to you find out what you know what is the community really doing these days uh, and I'm and I'm concerned with you yeah yeah I, I couldn't agree more um, which is why I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you I mean I think I think a lot of people feel really overloaded with information these days um, but it's a certain type of information and um, often it doesn't really give you a good sense of what is happening to individuals in our community, to the people that are on the ground, um, either working on the front lines as social service providers or um, the people in need of assistance. I mean, yeah. beyond um, the uh, food assistance, you know, you see the, the mile long wait uh, to receive groceries. Um, that coverage is very important. Um, but YPO, we, wasn't it? YPO was in the newspaper. At first I thought, oh, that's limited to San Antonio. Why is that happening here? It's happening here too. Yeah. No, I mean, going into, going into the pandemic, um, you know, there was a lot of attention actually to nearly half of the population um, teetering on the edge of yeah. financial calamity, um, not earning enough to uh, meet their basic needs. So and, you're you're a bunch of lawyers, am I right? Appleseed is, is a legal type organization. What who 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 are your staff, and what what are their what what's in their kit bag? You know what what <laughs> what tools do they have to achieve these goals? Yeah, um, we actually have very few lawyers now, um, and have expanded our toolkit substantially from uh, the time that we began. So Hawaii Appleseed was formed initially under the name Lawyers for Equal Justice in 2004. And we were set up as an offshoot of Legal Aid Society of Hawaii to do class action litigation um, on behalf of low-income residents in Hawaii. So that means hundreds or thousands of people are experiencing the same issue. Um, for example, public housing residents getting overcharged for their rents 
Lawyers for Equal Justice would bring a case to stop that ill unlawful practice and to ensure that people um, only pay what, what they're supposed to be paying so they have an opportunity to climb out of poverty. Um, so that was the beginning of the organization, but uh, 15, 16 years later, um, now we're separated into three different uh, components or projects. So we still have Lawyers for Equal Justice, uh, headed up by an uh, attorney named Tom Helper, who came to us out of the U.S. Attorney's Office. He was the chief of the Civil Div Division, really well qualified, doing great work. Yeah, I want to get him on the show. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, and I can tell you more about the work that he's doing right now in response to the pandemic. Um, we also have uh, a Hawaii Budget and Policy Center headed up by a woman named Beth Easting that's really focused on doing the data-driven research around state budget and tax issues. She was involved sure in, the, in the health initiative a couple of years ago, right? Right. Beth has a, a background in, in health. That is... Um, you know, where her main area of expertise is, but she's really digging into just state budgets issues in general, um, looking at the data behind them, mm -hmm. trying to, budgets are, the state budget especially is very mm -hmm. complex and mm -hmm. hard to understand. Just mm -hmm. trying to provide clarity around that to make sure that, um, you know, our budget really represents what our community values are. We're spending our money on what we really value. I'm so happy to hear you say that. Yeah, great. Um, and then uh, the most recent addition to the organization um, was we took on uh, what used to be a separate nonprofit called FOCUSED with a PH, stands for Protecting Hawaii's Ohana Children Underserved Elderly and Disabled. It's a mouthful. Um, but basically that is uh, more of a grassroots initiative um, trying to organize social service provider organizations and connect with the populations that they're serving. Really hearing the voices of the community that are impacted by the issues that we are focused on. So we have both a top-down, um, like think tankish aspects to our program, and then now this new grassroots, making sure that the policies that we're advocating for are informed by the community that is impacted by them. And, and you then, have a staff of, what, 6,000? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right now, we're the biggest we've ever been at 11 people. Oh, um, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> which, which seems huge compared to uh, just a few years ago when, you know, it was four of us working out of what felt like a closet. you got a lot of work to do, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, in our current office, we still have problems social distancing with 11 people, so most, most of us are working from home now. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, so what I caught out of that is uh, litigation is always a possibility, including class action suits. Advocation, adv advocacy, pardon me, uh, is, a, is a possibility. Um, I guess you could include in that lobbying in the legislature. That's right. Um, that's the last last piece um, under the Appleseed um, moniker, we are at the legislature um, advocating for things like uh, earned income tax credit to increase tax fairness, minimum wage, um, issues like that. So, you know, uh, one, one thing that occurs to me is that sometimes people have a perfectly good mm, initiative to advocate for, uh, but, but uh, there's no bill. And some, some of these bills, are they're hard to draft. And I wonder if you ever get involved in drafting bills um, because, you know, that's the way to actually get it done and not, and not have it lie on somebody's desk for a long time is to yeah. say, here, here's the bill. Try yeah. this. You know, yeah. Do you do that? So we do. Um, we assist in drafting bills. We do a lot of work on um, ensuring that the bills that are introduced um, make sense, that there aren't any unintended consequences. Um, you know, drafting, in, in my mind, as someone who, like, this is their day-to-day, -day, is such a small part of the equation because 3,000 bills or over 3,000 bills are introduced to each session. Um, around 300 get passed, so many die, um, either sad or happy death, depending on where you sit. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so a lot of our work is focused on preparing prior to the um, legislative session, helping just understand the concepts, the data behind the concepts, the way that those concepts might uh, impact the community, um, and then drafting the bill, getting it introduced, and then there's so much work to be done during session itself to try and shepherd that bill through to the end. Mm -hmm. Session, session is an interesting word in our time, session. We yeah. don't have a session, Gavin. So all the best bills uh, laid by mice and men, they're not going anywhere right now. We're That's in right. this kind of perpetual recess right now. So what, what do you think about that? What are you doing about that? What can you do about that? Yeah, so there, there is um, more work to be done than can possibly be done by us or others in the community. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of federal funding that's coming to the state that's supposed to be used to respond to the pandemic. And we've been working very hard to try and gather input from community stakeholders, try to understand what's coming in, what can be used for, what it can be used for, to really ensure that um, you know we are maximizing uh, the use of those resources, that we're getting as much as we can, and that we're um, putting it to as good of use as possible. So that's that's one thing that's really been occupying a lot of our time. The other thing is. Legislative session is going to come back. And in fact, um, just over the weekend, I heard that uh, next Monday, um, they will be opening up. Oh, really? Um, oh, that's hot news. Not not 100% confirmed, but, but that is the rumor. Um, that's my expectation. Mm -hmm. um, still don't have a lot of clarity on exactly what's going to be considered then. So um, right now we have folks uh, in the office or out of the office um, scrambling to try and figure out, you know, what's what's going to be under consideration and, and what should we um, be focused on oh, uh, sure. this coming week to prepare. It's an opportunity, actually, if they go back into a session. <clears throat> but I want to I want to circle back a little on the federal on the federal benefits that uh, you know that should be coming to Hawaii under the CARES Act uh, and under all the other benefits. I mean, two point three trillion plus another mm, six or seven hundred billion. What did Everett, Everett Dirksen say? After a while, it adds up to real money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, <That's> right. <clears throat> when you put that kind of money down, especially under this White House, um, you know there are going to be issues and problems about you know, misdirection of funds or um, legislation that, that happened too fast and doesn't go to the people that, who it truly should be intended to go to. And I wonder your thoughts about that. I mean, and first question is, uh, would you have done it differently? I make you Congress. You are now Congress. Would you have done it differently? <laughs> and, 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 and the second thing is, can this be fixed? Or is it just, or you, we just have to all get along with the idea that a lot of it is going to fall off the side? Yeah. Um, I think generally speaking, uh, there is a sense that what has been done so far is generally good. Um, but there are definitely questions about um, the distribution of those resources going to corporations versus people. Um, you know, there are definitely concerns there. And honestly, things have happened so quickly. Um, and it's just such a large volume of money and information. Um, I, don't think, I don't think even the experts have really been able to sift through everything. Um, and, and the consequences are going to play out over time, and we're going to see more and more as time goes on what the real issues are. Yeah. Um, uh, generally speaking, the uh, speed of the reaction is unprecedented. The volume of resources that are put in have been put in unprecedented. Those are good things from nearly everyone's perspective. Um, there are definitely concerns about, you know, who the resources are going to, um, and there are fights shaping up uh, at the federal level about what needs to be done next um, with the folks that we talk to a lot in, in D.C. and our national partners um, saying that so much more needs to be done to help individual people 
that are really struggling as a result of uh, the pan pandemic? Uh, I want to ask you two questions that have come in um, by email. Um, the first is, um, what is Appleseed, where does Appleseed funding come from? How are you supported? 70% of our funding is um, from foundations, um, primarily local foundations, Hawaii Community Foundation's a big supporter. Um, our budget center was supported, uh, its creation was supported by a hui of nine local foundations. Um, so primarily foundation support, um, about 10% from private donors, 10% from an annual fundraiser that we do, and then 10%, um, you know, just uh, from the sky, from heaven. Um, Indeed. Every once in a while, things come in. <laughs> so this is a follow-up to that. My own question is, uh, is if I'm an ordinary person, a uh, middle-class person, and I, I, I can get along for a few months without necessarily working, um, uh, and I have a few bucks that I might want to contribute to Appleseed, um, why should I? Um, why should I care about Appleseed as opposed to so many other nonprofit organizations uh, in the state of Hawaii? There are hundreds of them. Why yeah. Appleseed by now? Yeah. yeah. And, and let me say right now, there are so many organizations that are working on the front, front lines that are under-resourced under and need people's help, um, need people's donations and support. Um, we definitely need support from individuals to do our work. Um, and the reason why we think the work that we do is so important, why the support that people provide us is so important, because we um, try to be the connective tissue that helps bring a lot of groups together to solve complex problems. So for example, one of the issues that we're, um, we've been working on as part of our pandemic response has been on the um, hunger, hunger and food access issues. Uh, we're part of a hunger action network, Hawaii Hunger Action Network, that we helped build up. Um, and we also have a bunch of other uh, partners in the food systems community that we've been working in, working with, trying to pull folks together to ensure that um, students who were in school that relied heavily on school meals to meet their nutritional needs, um, and then when school didn't go back into session, we're left without access to those meals. DOE now has, I believe, over 70 schools that they're serving um, meals at, but it took a while to ramp up, still have a ways to go there. Um, so we helped coordinate a group of organizations to ensure that there were feeding sites where kids <clears throat> could get their meals. Um, and then, so try, trying to be that connective tissue between organizations that are on the ground, and then also um, just the trying to promote smart policy and systems change. You know, private philanthropy um, dollars can only go so far. Government dollars have much more potential to impact the lives of our people. And ensuring that those dollars are focused on helping Hawaii's residents that need it most. Um, you know, that's that's the work that we do. Yeah, it's a leverage thing. You can, you can bank for you, your buck. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, uh, by the way, just, just a footnote to that. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, we did a, a series of shows on the Aloha United Way beneficial, beneficiary charities. And we found that uh, there, are, there are two or 300 of them. Um, and we found, interestingly enough, over time that a lot of them we're addressing homelessness, and as it should be, that's got to be a major initiative in our state. Um, but, but what we also found is they were kind of in silos, and what they needed was coordination. Somebody, what did you use the term? The glue, the, the connective tissue. The connective tissue, and I think what you're doing there sounds like it meets the, you know, the, the problem that we saw in having various. Um, nonprofits all dealing with the same issue and not talking to each other. So the connective tissue, really important. Anyway, let me uh, let me go to the second question that came in. Okay, what specific projects are you working on now as would address, for example, homelessness? The status of those projects, uh, beginning, middle, end, 
um, medium and long term and, and the goals of those. That's a multiple compound question, but see if you can handle it, Kevin. <laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> oh, only six hours, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so uh, we do work in, in so many different areas and um, I would say the top three are uh, hunger, uh, food access, um, housing and homelessness, and um, then what we call economic security, which is primarily tax and wage issues. Um, let me just talk about uh, some of the pandemic response efforts that we're working on now, because um, I think those are uh, maybe the most relevant to our times. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, through Focused, which I described earlier as that network of social organizations. One thing that we're very concerned about, we saw in the Great Recession um, that there was a problem getting the resources that came from the federal government into the hands of the nonprofit social service providers who could then get the resources into the hands of the people that needed them most. Um, and so we've been working to bring together a group of social service providers to identify the issues that they've experienced and make sure that just things operate much more smoothly than last, last go around. So um, we uh, brought folks together, identified uh, a number of key issues, things like uh, payments not being timely processed for social service providers. So people waiting you know, months to receive the resources that they needed to do their work. Um, issues uh, about contracts that made sense two months ago, but don't make any sense now um, because of social distancing requirements, because there are just different needs than there were two months ago. Um, issues like that, raising them uh, on, on mass as a group um, of organizations. So we had um, just this morning, I was working on uh, compiling survey results from 40 plus social service provider organizations and just piecing it all together in a way that made sense. So we could say to Department of Human Services, to Department of Health, these are really the five things um, that we need to do now to ensure that people are able to get the resources that they need. So that's one. Um, I talked a little bit about the, the hunger work and trying to open up food sites for, um, for uh, people that were experiencing food insecurity now uh, because of job loss or because they were experiencing food insecurity prior to the pandemic. And we, and we do have that. We have that right now in Hawaii. People can't get food. Uh, right. They get on food bank lines and spend all day and, uh, yep. and they're unsatisfied. And that yep. leads to... Uh, it leads to bad places. Right. It leads to, to terrible places. I mean, these are people's most basic needs. And so the immediate work that we did was just trying to ensure that the food was there for them to get. The work that we're doing now is um, more midterm focused, trying to get all those folks who are suddenly without income to purchase food um, and can't rely on the food pantry all the time because the food pantry doesn't have enough resources to go around. Um, getting those people informed about their ability to get on the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, people, most people know it as food stamps, um, getting people onto that program. Education, so that, that's another right, thing right. in your kit bag. Yeah. Right, that's right. Um, and so working with those uh, boots on the ground that are getting, that's getting the food out there and just including the information about signing up for, for SNAP um, so that people can't just get food now from the food pantries, but will be able to get it a week from now, a month from now, you know, as long as, as long as we're facing this crisis. Mm. You know, you know, the problem, uh, we, we have a few minutes left. I want to throw this problem at you. Um, the problem is that at the end of the day, I mean, we're not even talking about, you know, therapeutics or vaccines or anything. 
we're, we're talking about living right now. We're talking about staving off disaster uh, for a lot of people. Um, that costs money. And the state has uh, virtually, you know, uh, well, it has very little tax returns coming in, tax, tax income coming in. The state, you know, um, has a balanced budget, constitutional requirements, hard for them to print money. Um, the federal government is not giving the states any money for uh, Donald Trump's own special reasons. Uh, <laughs> we won't go into that now. Um, but the state may not be a great source to solve these problems. Um, individual, you know, philanthropists may help. Uh, foundations, nonprofit foundations may help. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's money. Um, and I'll just give you the example that comes to my mind. So in yesterday's news or the day before, um, there are rent strikes going on. And say New York, uh, where thousands of, of tenants of um, you know, rental properties have decided they're not gonna pay the rent. Uh, they can't afford it. Or maybe some of them can, but they're not saying, they're just not paying. Um, and, and the landlords may be, they may be ordinary people, you know, who have an investment in a condo, who knows what. They may not be able to af afford the fixed expenses while the tenant stays there. So you have a, a real discom economic discombobulation here. And if you ask these uh, small-time landlords to absorb that expense, they may they may be out of business right there. You have a, you have a chain of disaster, is what happens, and um, you know ultimately it's it's banks, I suppose. But how do you balance that? Who bears the brunt of taking care of the disadvantage? If the state has no money, the Fed is cooperating, but only to a limited degree, in my opinion. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, philanthropists can only go so far, um, and if you if you tell them not to pay the rent, then you have a then you have a possibility of a general collapse on your hands of, of the money system, the banking system. Um, so who bears the cost and how do you, I mean, Hawaii Appleseed, how do you crank that whole dilemma into your policy? Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, great question. And this is the stuff that we've been thinking about um, like every day. Um, the the rent situation that you described it is an ecosystem and you can't just tell tenants like stop paying your rent and then you're done like that does not solve the problem um because you're absolutely right like landlords need to be able to pay their mortgage and if they're not able to pay their mortgage and they get foreclosed on um you know that's that's not helpful um and and you know i do not have a three sentence answer for that problem. I never promised you a rose garden, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> but here's here's what we here are the um, main themes that we are are trying to put out there. The main values. Number one, like we are all in this together, and um, our solutions need to be um, solutions that where we're. It's not just small subsets of the population that's bearing the brunt. Like we need to spread it out evenly and equitably. Um, so that's number one. Related to that is there's no genius, no white knight that's gonna save us from this problem. Like it is a community problem. And uh, there's very much a, a pull I think towards this idea that we can get smart legislators, smart leaders to pull us out of this. Um, I think there are some folks, some leaders right now that feel that responsibility. And the more that we can get away from that and focus on how do we engage the entire community to solve this problem together, the smartest person in the world is not gonna know what is happening in Kalihi if they're not in Kalihi experiencing what's happening to them. They're not gonna know what's happening in Hawaii if they're not in Hawaii knowing what's like experiencing that. We need to engage everybody in um, the solving of these problems. Yeah, and the, uh, the question that flows out of that, which we can never answer is, what, can, what, what are you telling me I should do? And the answer, is in Thomas Jefferson's words. He said, find a way to make yourself useful. 
That's what he said. <laughs> and there are things that can be done that will help us with that. If um, if our if our government is communicating well with folks, is telling them, you know, here's the timeline of what's happening and the decisions that we're making, um, which there's room for improvement there right now. That's what we're really hoping um, to see in the very near, near future. I know everybody's scrambling right now to get their heads around this. But the more communication with government folks that are ultimately making the decisions, the easier it is for people to follow Thomas Jefferson's advice and find those ways that they can contribute. Yeah, thank you, Gavin Thornton. Great to talk with you. I hope we can do it again. We wanna stay in touch with Hawaii Appleseed and, and follow your path. Thank you so much, aloha. Thank you. Take